What is the tenth commandment? The tenth commandment is, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does the tenth commandment require? The tenth commandment requires us to be completely satisfied with our own status in life and to have a proper, loving attitude toward others and their possessions. What does the tenth commandment forbid? The tenth commandment forbids any dissatisfaction with what belongs to us, envy or grief at the success of others, and all in proper desire for anything that belongs to us. I told Dan I was going to be really good. I promise. I was like, oh, I never forget to turn on my microphone. <laughs> and I did it. Okay, my mic is on now. I'll start over. Uh, our reading today, in addition to the 10th commandment, which we just all spoke together, it comes from Exodus 20, is a reading from 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 10. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts and minds be holy and pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I am uh, glad to be with you all today and privileged, only mildly intimidated, uh, to be sharing this message this week. Um, I mean, a couple weeks ago when Dennis stepped in, to Pastor Dennis stepped in to preach for Pastor Lori, I remember him saying something like, yeah, Lori called me and I was like, yeah, I'll preach on anything as long as it's not the 10th commandment. And afterwards I ran up and I was like, we saved that one for me. And genuinely, like, Lori and I agreed that I would preach this Sunday a while ago, and um, I remember coming the first Sunday that we were doing the 10 Essential series, and I started counting, and I was like, okay, I get coveting. So I've been thinking about coveting all summer, (laughs) all summer long, and I genuinely was like, that's a far way away. I am preaching in September. Well, it is September 1st, (laughs) and here we are. Uh, It has really flown by summers in the Pacific Northwest do, and I uh, have lived in the PNW since I was in sixth grade, and I think that being raised here, I understand the assignment during summer. Like, during summer, you are taking advantage of the late sunsets and the early sunrises, which means late nights and early mornings. There is a lot to do here in the summer. There's always a festival going on. There's always a park where there's something fun happening. You got to get down to the beach. There's a paddleboard calling your name. There's a couple of vacations thrown in there. And so when it comes to the end of the summer, I'm like totally refreshed and recharged from all the sunshine and like totally exhausted from all of the like super long days. Like I am the person who last night was like, wow, the sun is down before eight. I have like two hours before I need to go to bed. This is awesome because I'm like, if the sun is out, I'm out. Um, And so now I'm like, get real time to do things in my home before I go to bed at night. Um, but genuinely, we, I hope you had a really great 
summer. We had a really great summer. We had the opportunity to go visit my sister and her husband and my dad and my niece, who all live in Pennsylvania. Um, And we did something that happens every time we go visit my sister, who lives in Pennsylvania. And that is, we got into Pokemon Go again, because my sister and my dad and her and my sister's husband all still play Pokemon Go all the time. Like they are always going on Poke Walks to walk around and catch the Pokemon and fight the battles and do the gyms. And I left this behind kind of a while ago, but every time we go there, we somehow get back into it because it's like what they do every day. And like Jimmy, Jimmy played Pokemon as a kid. Me, I did not. I'm not kind of like an OG Pokemon person, but I was a youth director when Pokemon Go came out, which was like the best bonding activity ever. Because you're like, hey, you want to go walk around in a park, catch some Pokemon and talk about your life and Jesus? It was really, really good uh, opportunity to get to know students. Um, But again, like I knew who Pikachu was, but I was not like a person who played Pokemon growing up. And so I was really shocked um, this last week when I was talking to my colleague and she was telling me that in the original Pokemon game or, or Generation 3 of the, I don't know, some, like not Pokemon Go, Pokemon game. Someone's coming up and correcting me about all of this after service. It's probably going to be my husband. Um, the original Pokemon game, there's like, I think this is how it works, a certain Pokemon that has an attack move that's called, can you guess? Covet. It has an attack move that's called Covet. And what does the move do? When these Pokemons are in a little battle uh, and the move Covet is used, it attacks the other player's Pokemon and then it steals an item that the Pokemon is holding. Now I find this fascinating because I think that so often when we think about what coveting is, we think, well, it's just me wishing that I had something someone else had. It's kind of like dreaming. Like, I'm just kind of like dreaming big, you know? I just, like, I kind of just want that, but it's, it's not really that big of a deal. It's not like it's harming anybody. It's just something I'm thinking about in my head, in my heart. Is it actually all that bad to covet? We come to this last commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, or his ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. And we might find ourselves wondering, like, how does this one stack up to all those other commandments? All those other commandments that seem so intense, like no adultery, no stealing, no bearing false witness, no murder. And then you get the 10th commandment, which is like, yeah, and don't want the stuff that other people have. You know, you're kind of like, how... Does this one stack up against the other commandments? What is this commandment all about? And why is it placed next to all these other ones that are seemingly more intense? And why is it the last one? My colleague, Dr. Sarah Koenig, is an Old Testament scholar, and very conveniently for me, uh, she's writing a book on the Ten Commandments right now. And so I asked if I could see her draft on the coveting chapter, and she Uh, drew the distinction that I'm sort of getting at uh, really well between those other commandments and this 10th commandment. She says, unlike commandments that get broken by someone's action, a murder is committed, an object is stolen, a false testimony is spoken, this commandment mostly exists in the heart or in the mind of the person who may be coveting without anyone else seeing or knowing. And it's true, that distinction is there. But what I would argue is that it rarely stays there. Perhaps the creator of Pokemon Go attack moves, or no, regular Pokemon attack moves are on to something. That coveting rarely stays in secret and often leads to outward actions of attack, actions that cause harm. Perhaps the command for us not to covet is a command that speaks to the root of so many of the other commandments. 
Why are so many people driven to stealing? Because they want something that someone else has and they do not. Coveting in secret leads to all sorts of sin that can be seen. Don't get me started on a gardening roots and you know, plants analogy, but you know the analogy. Deprecating speech from jealousy that turns into bitterness. Stealing, and in the worst cases, coveting can even lead to violence and murder. Take, for example, two brothers. We meet very early on in the biblical narrative, Cain and Abel. Cain, angry and jealous of his brother offering the fat portions from his flock. Cain, jealous and dare I say covetous of his brother Abel's success and found favor with God, goes from coveting in his heart to opening the door to sin that is crouching on his doorstep, and he attacks and murders his brother. Or take, for example, another set of brothers that we meet in Genesis, Jacob and Esau, And Jacob's jealousy, perhaps even covetousness for Esau's birthright. It leads him to manipulate Esau into selling his birthright to Jacob and then leads Jacob to falsely present himself as Esau to his father Isaac so that he could officially receive that birthright. So what began as coveting in their hearts What began is desiring what another person had deep down in their souls. What started out as an internal desire manifested itself into external action. The murder of Abel, the manipulation of Esau, stealing what was not one's own, and lying to one's own father. Got a couple of the commandments in there, huh? When we let covetousness sink in, when we let disordered desire live and rule in our hearts, it harms us, making us discontent and greedy and bitter, but it also leads towards outward actions that can harm our neighbors, too. So the Tenth Commandment for us gets to the root of so many of our external actions, And maybe that's what Paul is getting at when he says in 1 Timothy that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. But here's the thing. Some of you are probably thinking, Ashley, that's a bit dramatic. Like, I think my neighbor's house is is nice. Like, I would like it. I really am interested in my neighbor's electric car. It's really fancy. It basically drives itself. It's good for the environment. So, like, I actually should want it, you know, because it's good for the environment. So, like, my coveting in this situation is good. It's holy. No worries here. Um, But even though I want all those things, I would never take them. I'm not going to steal for them. I'm not going to murder for them. Like, You just made a couple jumps that seem a bit too dramatic, Pastor. So is coveting really that big of a deal? If I can just keep it internal, does it really matter so much? In her book, The Very Good Gospel, which is, I love that book. It's a great one. Lisa Lisa Sharon Harper frames the narrative of the first few chapters of Genesis and really kind of the whole of God's story in Scripture around this concept of shalom. Now, shalom is one of those Hebrew words that you've probably heard before, and it's got, you know, all these broad and big definitions because our English language doesn't have one simple word that really translates well enough for us to understand the kind of vastness of this concept. But for simplicity's sake, I'm going to give that word shalom a translation of peace. It's a very commonly used translation. So Harper, she writes about the idea of shalom, this idea of peace, as yes, including peace with our neighbors. But she also says it includes peace with God and peace with ourselves. So if pursuing peace only meant we have to get along with our neighbors, then internal desire and covetousness, I suppose, wouldn't be such a big issue if you really thought it could just stay there, stay on the inside. 
But since true peace requires peace in our souls and peace with God, then even our internal desires matter. Because what might not harm our neighbor could very well be eating us out from the inside out. And I, I think this commandment about coveting speaks to each one of those categories. We've already talked about how coveting keeps us from living at peace with our neighbor. But now let's take a look at how coveting keeps us from living at peace with ourselves. And most importantly, it keeps us at, from living at peace with God. So I was in middle school once, um, and I'm sure lots of you were too. For me, middle school was kind of a tough time. Anybody else here had a hard time in middle school? Um, I have some friends now that were in kind of like, like at middle school at the same time with me. I wasn't friends with them then, but they're my friends now. And they're always kind of surprised by me sharing this because I probably did look like middle school was great for me. I was in ASB and I did sports and I, um, you know, like was in honors classes. I kind of like did all the things. But I looked around and remember, I was in middle school, so everything felt a little bit like the end of the world. And this might seem a little over dramatic, but it's how it felt back then. And I would look, so I would look around, and it felt like all the girls were wearing makeup, and I didn't know how to do my makeup. I didn't really have any. I had some like really bad uh, blue eyeshadow that I tried putting on all the time. It looked awesome uh, in hindsight. <laughs> um, looked around. All the girls seemed to know how to do their hair. Maybe some of them were even like already getting it colored. I didn't, I didn't know how to braid. I didn't have like a straightener to, like I just didn't know how to do all those things. Looked around. All the girls uh, were like wearing Abercrombie. And um, my parents were like, yeah, I mean, the deal is if you want to wear Abercrombie, we're going to find that at a thrift store. Now, this was before thrift stores were cool. They're very cool now. So I think like middle school actually would have been a lot better off now than I was in middle school where I was like kind of embarrassed that we had to go buy clothes from the thrift store. Um, and so I just looked around and I saw all these things that other people had and I didn't have them. And middle school actually taught me so much about what I need to know today, about coveting, about wishing I had what other people had and how it kept me from being at peace with myself. One commentator called coveting the sin of insecurity. I was really insecure. And I look back in my yearbooks and I really wasn't like that better off or like or that like better or worse off than anyone else I see in those photos. And ultimately, as much as it felt like all of that mattered so much, I can stand here now and say that was really fleeting. Looking back, it did matter very little. But desiring better clothes, better hair, better makeup, more money, more status, you name it, desiring those things became my whole world. And you know what? Even when I got the stuff, because I was an insufferable teenager who would just beg my parents over and over and over again, so even when I talked my parents into buying me ridiculously priced clothes that I knew they couldn't afford, it wasn't enough. There was always something more. I always wanted more. But the myth of more was just that. It was a myth. Having more was never going to make me any more lovable or any more content in any way that truly mattered. And who in this room doesn't want to take that 12-year-old girl, put their hands on her face and look her in the eye and say, hey, you are enough. You, just as God has created you in all your beauty and in all of who you are by God's grace, you are enough. 
And maybe some of us now who are in our 30s and our 50s and our 70s need to be reminded with all tenderness and compassion that who we are and the life we've built and the relationships we have are enough. And we can stop the striving and the keeping up with the next best thing our neighbors have and simply rest in the life we have here, right now. The text from 1 Timothy says that those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. It is a spiraling, chaotic trap. Coveting feeds us a false true that a false truth that if we just fill in the blank, we would be happy. But as I learned in middle school, it will never be enough. And I don't know why it's so easy to look at that example of the 12-year-old girl and say it makes perfect sense. And then to try and apply it to our adult lives and say, well, but I mean, it's kind of different now, you know? If I just lived in my neighbor's house, it's fully updated, it just has that one thing that I need, I would be happy. If my partner were just a little bit more like this other person I know, then that would solve all our relationship problems. And I would be happy. If I just had three more donkeys, I'm just kidding, three more donkeys would not make any part of my modern life more happy. (laughs) But whatever your, if I just, if we just is, it is a lie. The text goes on to say that some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Because in fact, many people who have chased after the if I just have found themselves more alone, more stressed, more lost, more discontent. Indeed, it has pierced them with many griefs when they, when we thought, if I just had promised us happiness. So for those of us who have found ourselves in that trap, and I'll raise my hand, I've been in that trap before and not just when I was 12 years old. It's pretty easy to get in that trap living in Seattle. So for those of us who have been in that trap before, let me be the one to speak into the temptation and into the striving and into even the griefs that coveting has cost you. You right here, as you are, by God's grace, are enough. Full stop. No if I just. Instead, find your rest here. Find your peace here. And that peace ultimately, that rest ultimately, it does not come from just being at peace with ourselves. It comes first and foremost from finding peace with God. Because if we were to say, okay, okay, yeah, I'll just be happy with what I have, I'll just be content with all these things that I have, then it's still all the things, all this stuff that we can't take with us when we are in the end of our days that we are relying on to make us content. There is, we believe, truly and only one way to be wholly content. And it is to be content first and fully in Christ. Augustine's great work, Confessions, begins with one of his most famous quotes. It's always good when you start off with the best. Um, And I'll paraphrase it slightly here. He says that the thought of God stirs us so deeply that we cannot be content until we praise God. Because God made us for himself and our hearts find no peace until they rest in him. Our hearts find no peace 
until they rest in God. This is where the whole of the sermon has been leading, and this is where the 10th commandment loops right back around to the first. Coveting, love of money, all the things we lust after and wish to have and desire for take us away from our first desire we must have in our life, which is a desire for God and for God alone. We are commanded first to have no other gods before our God. Not the God of money, nor the God of success. Not the God of fame, nor the God of perfectionism. Not the God of fortune, or the God of striving, or the God of if I just. No other gods before our God. When God tells us this, he is telling us that the one true God, our Father, made known to us in Jesus Christ, with us still through the power of the Holy Spirit, is to be our one true desire, our first desire. And then that desire will order our other desires. And so when these commandments conclude with the prohibition of coveting, it is a reminder of how easy it is for us to get our desires out of order and for our hearts to be unquieted because we have placed our hopes in the things of this world and we have put endless things before God, the only one who brings our hearts to rest. Now, I have to take Anne aside because what I appreciate about the passage from 1 Timothy 6 is that it says this line, For if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. And there's kind of a, but what about question that happens to the coveting command? Like, but like, what if I don't have food? Or like, if I don't have a safe place to live? And I I think it's okay to interpret this passage, this saying that Paul says, you know, that you have food and clothing, to interpret it as our basic needs for livelihood, to include things like shelter and stability. Now, I am not saying that we can't be at peace with God regardless of our situation. We can. But there's a provision that there are certain things we need in this life to live well, and to desire those is not covetous. Food, clothing, shelter, stability, it is not covetous to seek these things if we don't have them. We can still experience rest and contentedness in Christ without them, but life will be much more challenging without three de- meals a day for sustenance, without, three, without clothes for dignity, without shelter for one's safety, without stability that allows for building a life and a livelihood. Paul ne- notes that there are certain things we do need to live well. The list is small and it's simple, but there are a few things. And here's what's beautiful about ordered desires. In the world of covetousness, we care about our neighbor because we care about what they have and how we can get it. In the world where our first desire is Christ, we care about our neighbor too, but we care about the livelihood and the well-being of our neighbor. Instead of wrongly desiring for our neighbor's things, we rightly desire for our neighbor's good. A blunt example, instead of desiring for our neighbor's house, perhaps we should be desiring shelter for our neighbors who have no place to call home. We must let lives of contentedness replace lives of covetousness. We must let lives of generosity replace lives of greed. We must let lives of kindness replace lives of bitterness. And when we do this, by allowing our hearts to first rest in Christ then we allow the Spirit to work so that day by day, our concern for our neighbor is transformed. Paul continues his letter to Timothy, and right as he is closing, he returns to the topic of money. And he gives advice specifically to those who might find themselves to be rich in the things of this world. So I find these uh, few verses to be encouraging, even today. He says in verses 17 through 19, As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on the God who richly provides us with 
everything for enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future. I love this part. So that they may take hold of the life that really is life. So that they may take hold of the life that really is life. That's what I want. I don't want to waste my life being covetous and striving for more and more and if I just and if I just only to never be happy. I want a rich life of abundance. I want a life that really is life. And I want that for each one of you too. Life that is a full, life that is abundant, life that is at peace. Let's pray.